All right, so again, for today, what we're going to do is, is uh, go over more, more uh, sorting algorithms. Specifically, we need to go over, you know, merge, sort, and... It's a little trash. Oh wait, no, there it is. There it is. I was worried I left the adapt. Oh my. Well, that was um front place to uh, play, play fell off. I have that that is interesting. Well, sorry. Feel so lonely. I mean that. That's what happens with this class. People stop showing up. Okay, it's just, uh, it's not like, um, so anyway, I'm not sure what the uh, future homework's going to look like. Um, there's also a possibility that I may just uh, avert the whole doing a final time lab. So they may not be a third time lab. Instead, I might just, uh, I might just take the 5% of the last time, time lab and move it into the final exam, right? So the final exam would be worth 25%. So, um, and that really just... Depends on what I feel. What I feel makes sen uh, the most sense um, for this, uh, for what we've been doing. Um, so let's go into display settings, laptop, and for, again, what we're going to do today is more of the uh, more of the same. Uh, so we left off with insertion sort. Right? We left off with uh, insertion sort. And, um, let's see, close up two. So with insertion sort, that we had learned that basically that it was a pretty efficient algorithm, right? Right, it, insertion sort is fairly efficient for, do, for small data sets. Um, and when I say efficient, it's efficient compared to like, uh, to something like selection sort, right? With selection sort, if we had two, one, three, four, five, all the way up to 100,000, right? Then with selection sort, we'd, we'd go through 100,000 items to find this, to find the smallest item and put it here. Then we go to, then we go and find the second item and put it here, and the third item and put it here, and the fourth item and put it here. And basically, it would take uh, n squared time. Insertion sort says, okay. Let's turn this into a sorted array, unsorted array. Okay, take the last thing from the unsorted array, put it into, and push it down, and insert it into the sorted portion. So one is less than two, so we need to swap them. One's at the beginning, so we need to swap them. Okay, and then we have the unsorted array and sorted array, and then for the rest of the unsorted array, which is already sorted, we go oh three. So three is bigger than two, so we don't need to move it. Four is bigger than three, so we don't need to move it. Five is bigger. Uh, four, so we don't remove it, so on and so forth, until we get to the end. So fixing something like that takes about it is like it's constant time. It's pretty efficient. So um, so not constant time. It's linear time. I almost said why I said constant time. I swear I'm not as sick as I sound. Uh, felt bad on Friday, um, but you know it's just <laughs> my voice sometimes goes when I get these things. Okay, so um, Kaufman. Um, right, here we go. One, there we go. So, I'm going to uh, skip shell sort. You can look it up yourself. For the most part, I'm going to skip shell sort. The way it does is, works is that basically insertion sorts, it's a multiple pass insertion sort. We're just insert, it does uh, insertion sort on a bunch of subarrays. Uh, and then it figures out those subarrays with like a gap, and that gap is what makes it interesting. We don't uh, once you figure out how big that gap's going to be, what sequence for those gaps to be, uh, that influences basically the runtime of, of shell sort. If you run shell sort basically just like without gaps, it's insertion sort. But what's interesting is is that we don't know what time time given a gap uh, runs. The worst case is going to do is insertion sort, which is O n squared. But if you use uh, powers of, if your gap size is like powers of two minus one, 
then you get O of 3 divided by 2, right? That's, uh, that's uh, n times square root n, so, essentially, right? That, that's uh, much less time than O of n squared, than O of n squared, right? So, and we really don't know, and it's an open problem as to what the, uh, what the uh, lower bound of this could be, how well short shell sort can go. And it's still an open question in computer science. Um, so sorting is still unsolved, kind of an unsolved problem in that regard. So now we're gonna, but what I wanna focus on is the, is that I'm gonna focus on merge sort and quick sort uh, today. So merge sort is one of the, is um, the first of the divide and conquer algorithms. And it's a nice hacky solution in the sense that basically it relies off of, um, let's see, it relies off of two hacks. I can't really bring this with me, unfortunately. Um, uh, the first hack is one we've already discovered, which is that arrays of, so of size one are already sorted. And the second hack is the merge operation, which you which you've had to do, I think, in a practice exam with a linked list. Okay, and the merge operation just simply says that um, basically, given these two sorted lists, merge them together into a single sorted list. So what merge sort is going to do is that it's going to essentially merge together a bunch of sorted lists. If merge operation is very common, taking two sequences of data that are sorted and uh, and just merging them together. And merging takes O of n time, right? It's actually pretty uh, straightforward to do a merge operation. So I'll do, uh, I'll show you guys an example of a merge first, and then I will, um, and then I'll show you guys how that works. So, one second. There we go. So let's go ahead and look at a merge, uh, um, merging two sorted lists together. So, um, one, two, five, three, four, six. Okay, so we've got two sorted lists that I'm gonna put together into a single sorted list, okay? Now, merging them together is actually not a hard operation. It requires, um, because it's really easy to do. The code is sometimes somewhat uh, tedious to write, but it's not that hard. First thing to do is make something that's, you know, size A and size B. Right, size this, that basically we can hold both the sizes, right? But if you're using an array list and whatever, or a linked list, it doesn't really matter. It will resize for you automatically. And then what you do is you compare the first thing in both the lists, okay? And then you ask which one's the smaller one, okay? Um, well, one is smaller than three, so it goes into our list first, okay? Two is smaller than then we then we just keep going for um, so we remove one, then we keep going, and then we just Keep doing the same thing again and again. So, which is smaller, two or three? Two is smaller, so remove two, put it here. Which is smaller, five or three? Three is smaller. Okay. Which is smaller, four or six? I mean, this is a very easy operation for us to figure out. Four is smaller than six. Uh, five is small. I'm oh, sorry, four is smaller than five. Five is smaller than six. Put five next. Then we, then this one's empty. So when once one is empty, we can just basically take all the rest of the items, so like six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and we could just and we can just copy them over, right? Because all these items are going to be bigger than everything in this list because they're not already in the list. So six, seven, eight, nine, ten, right? So merging takes it, it takes one compares it takes basically one comparison per item to do, and then for every item that's not left over. Then while we still have items, it just takes an operation to move them over. So their example. So we want to access the item. The first, so merge algorithm. Access the first item for both uh, sequences. While we're not finished with either sequence, compare the items, copy the smaller current item into the output, and get and you know move forward in the sequence. And then when we're done, while one of them is when one more of the sequence is done. Copy all the remaining items from the first, copy all the remaining items from the second. So here we've got 244, 311, and let me zoom in on that. Um, yay. So we've got these numbers, 244, 3, uh, 311, 478, 324, 415, 4999, and 505. 
So first we compare 244 to 324. Which of these is uh, smaller? 244 is, so we go with that in. 311 is smaller than 324, so that goes in. 324 is smaller than 478. 415 is smaller than 478. 478 is smaller than 499, so we put it there. And then 499 and uh, 505, those are left over, so we just simply copy them over to the end. So that's merge. It takes it's O of M where N is the number of items in both uh, is 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 the is the size of sequence A and the size of sequence B. Um, merging in place, let's just say that we can't do it. Okay, uh, merging. I I I've heard of, of merge sort being able to be done in place, but um, for these merge operations, we need basically if we're merging in items, we need a separate output, right, that holds all the items in it. So you need so you need O of N space to do it. So unlike all the other sorting algorithms uh, that use constant space, um, merge sort will need uh, an extra, you know, it'll need O of N space. Now the reason we'll still use it is because its best case scenario is N log N time. Its average case scenario is N log N time. Right? And its worst case scenario is N log N time. It runs really fast. Okay, so merge sort is pretty, is the, it's a pretty simple, it's actually a recursive algorithm. It uses, it's a recursive algorithm. It's fairly straightforward. Uh, split the half, uh, split the array into two halves. Merge sort the left half. Merge sort the right half. Then merge the two halves, right? So you sort the left half, sort the right half. You've got two sorted halves, and then you can merge them into a whole unit. Okay, so then we do it recursively. <laughs> right. So, so right. If we want to write it so that we, uh, you know, we've got a method called, uh, you know, sort. It takes in a a list of numbers. Right. Let's go ahead and say right is equal to the right half of lists, right? And splitting it in half, is just basically it's its own operation figure out yourself, but it's not too complicated. Left is equal to the left, and then, you know, same thing, left half of the list, right? Sort left. Sort right um, list is equal to merge left right return list right oh and if it's recursive we need a base case right. So we need a base case here, which is the first hack that I just said uh, at the very beginning, which is that if we are trying to sort something of a that's a single item, right? If we're trying to sort a single an, an array of size one, right? Then it's uh, let me just sort then then it's already sorted. So if if list has one or Zero items. Return list. And I suppose since we're returning, I've got to do left is equal to sort left right is equal to sort right. So this is merge sort in a nutshell. Uh, we sort a list by if it if it's if it's a, our base case zero, one or zero items, then we return it. That's our base case. It's already sorted. It's one or zero items. That's easy. Otherwise, we split it into a right half and a left half. We sort the left half. We sort the right half. Right. We call, do that recursively, and then when they're sorted, we merge them together. It's a fairly straightforward algorithm. So let's see how that works in practice. Okay. Let's see how that works in practice. All right. 
All right. So here's our array. Seven, two, three, five, one, four, six, eight. Okay. So we need to um, we want to do merge sort on this. Okay. And let's go ahead and move this upside over here. So we want to do merge sort on this algorithm. Sorry, on this uh, array. So how do we do that? Um, well, the first thing we would do is we'd split it into a left half and a right half, right? And we'd sort the left half and right half, right? And for the left half, we split that into half, left half and right half, right? Okay? And then for that left half, we'd split it into a left half and a right half. Okay? This left half is sorted, this right half is sorted. I'm just going to kind of put them into a box. So you've got seven and two, right? There's, there's seven has been sorted, two has been sorted, right? Because they're size one. Now we have to merge seven and two together. Into a single, into a single array or single list, right? Two is less than seven, so it goes in first. Then we copy it. We've got two and seven now, okay? And we've got this, the right side of this. Then we split this into the left half and right half. So we've got three, we've got five, right? And we need to merge them together into a single unit. So you merge them together, and you've got three and five. Okay. And now to sort the left half completely, we need to merge these two sorted halves together. Okay. Okay. So two is less than three. So two goes in first. Three is less than seven. Five is less than seven. Seven is last one, so we copy it over. So we sort the left half. Now the right half. We split this in half. We split the left half of the right half in half. Right, they turn out to be sorted, so we merge them together into one and four. And then we merge six and eight together into six and eight. Right? Then we merge that half together, so we get one, four, then six and eight get copied over into the end. Okay, so we successfully split it into a let. So we sorted the left half, we sorted the right half, now we merge together the two sorted halves. Okay? Which is smaller, one or two? One is smaller. Two is smaller than four. Three is, sorry, no, three. Three is smaller than four. Five, uh, four is smaller than five. Five is smaller than six. Six is smaller than seven. Seven is smaller than eight. Eight is less and less, so we copy it over, so we just completely sort it. All right. Now, what's amazing is how much time this takes, right? Splitting doesn't really take too much time at all, right? We're just doing recursive calls to split it, essentially. You get the left half to slice an array in half. It's not so bad. It's just a couple mathematical operations. So how long does the merge take? Well, it takes O of n time, right? So um, and we look at it like this. We had to merge together four groups of two over here. So we had to move, which is eight, which n eight is eight. So let n be eight in this case, right? Because we have eight items. So we had to move merge together four groups of two, right? Or, sorry, um, yeah, four group four pairs together. Then we had to merge together uh, two groups of, of um, two pairs of four. And then we had to merge together eight items total, right? So we have to merge our, or if you want to think of it this way, we had to merge together our singles, then our pairs, then our quads, right? So we merge together our singles, we merge together our, path, our, our pairs, we merge together our, our quads. Okay, so that was eight total here, eight total on this layer, eight total on this layer, right? So we had eight, so each of these layers took two times. And there were three layers for this case. Now, why does this be, is this log uh, log of n? Why is it, we call it n log n? Well, we had each of these layers is O of n time, right? How many layers were there? There were log n layers. 
right? There were three layers, two to the third power is eight. There are three, so, so merge sort runs n log n time because you're always gonna have these layers. Now, if there was a ninth item, then yeah, we'd have a fourth. If there were nine items, there'd be a fourth layer, right? But up to 16 items, you'd have four layers, right? You can imagine if this was the right half, this was the left half of, of merge sort, and then you had another eight items, right? We'd have another layer where we'd be merging eight items together and then another eight items together, right? And that would be a total of 16 items, right? Because this one would have have their own qu uh, quads merged together, which came from their own pairs merged together, which came from their own singles merged together, right? That makes sense? And that would have been 16 items merged together in n log n time. So um, merge sort works like this. It always runs n log n time, always. So here's their example, which is also not, a, which is actually a nice animated example. So we, so we, right to search to merge sort this, we split it into two halves, right? Then we split one each half into halves. We split fifty into fifty and sixty. Okay. And merge. So now we need to merge them back together. Fifty and sixty merge together back to. So fifty goes in first. Sixty goes in first. 45 gets merged in 45 and 30, 30 goes in first, then 45. Then to merge together 50, 60, 30, and 45, 30 goes in first and 45, then we copy over 50 and 60. Then we need to merge short the other half. All right, split in half, split in half, 20 goes in first, then 90, split in half again, 15 goes in first, then 80, then 15, then 20, then 80, then 90. Then 15 goes in first, then 20, then 30, then 45, then 50, then 60, then 80, then 90. So each backward step is takes n elements from smaller size to L arrays to larger arrays. Um, you know, so simply, it basically, it's just saying that basically you have log n layers. Each layer takes O of n time to, to, to handle. So the total amount of time is n log n. But it's also going to take uh, O of n space because we need to copy each layer. We, need, we have a lot of copying over to do. Because, so that's the sacrifice of merge sort. Merge sort requires extra space, at least, at least the way we taught it. Um, if we go and look up merge sort on Wikipedia, which is really, a, again, an excellent article on Wikipedia, because they really do show, you know, nice animations of how it works, right? Split it up, then they split those up, then they split those up, right? It shows how we can merge those, each of those into uh, together, right? And it shows that basically how, how do you do the merge? Okay, and it says that it takes worst case space uh, complexity, O of n with O of n auxiliary. But if you use linked lists, then you don't need much time at all because guess what? Merging linked lists is pretty easy because you're just moving one node from another. Uh, you're moving one node from one area to another node, right? You just simply are moving around pointers again. So doing, so actually, so do, you, so that's actually something to consider. You gotta consider, wait, how long does it take to do stuff like insertion sort or selection sort if I'm working with a linked list? Right? Does that change how, the, how I'm going to methodically move around the algorithm? Because it's swapping stuff is a bit harder, right? But again, for selection sort, you're always going through iteratively, so you're always finding something. Same thing with insertion sort, you're always going iteratively, and for bubble sort, you're always doing pairs. So so long as you can construct it, those shouldn't really change too much. But linked lists are kind of ideal for merge sort. Um, Right, here's another visual uh, representation of it where we've got the dots, right? You've got, they merge together in halves and then, you know, they group together. Essentially, they merge together the sorted bits, or, or sorry, the sorted parts of it. Um, and there's, a, you know, so merge sorted is fairly straightforward, um, but this is what we call divide and conquer. Essentially, divided, we kept dividing the problem in half, okay? until we've solved each each problem and then we merged our answers together. 
Okay. So I'm going to uh, skip over heap sort because it's not recursive. I want to come back to it later. I'm going to come back to it later. I want to, if we're going to be doing recursion, I might as well stick with recursive sorting algorithms for right now. So the other one is quick sort, which has the, the other recursive algorithm is quick sort developed in 1962. It's good. It's your, and you're kind of expected to know quick sort and merge sort. Heap sort, not necessarily, but it's fantastic to know. Um, but merge sort and quick sort are definitely ones that, that if you're hired anywhere, you're expected to know what those are. Okay. Quick sort's actually really easy to do, um, um, because it it makes sense. So what you do is you grab a value out of you say you're trying to sort something. You grab a value. Just grab like say you're trying to just sort our students again. So we grab a random student, okay, and their last name is I'll use mine, Rosen, okay. So R. We just grab one randomly out of there. We call that our pivot, okay. And then we partition the rest of the our, my, our pile into two parts. We take all the stuff that comes before R and put it in one pile. And then we take all the stuff and, that comes after R and put it in another pile. And then we repeat for for those for each of those two piles. We recursively quick sort on these on those piles. We grab something out of there that's our new pivot, split it up into two piles, and then recursively do that. Okay. Um. So and. What's nice about this one is that we can do it in place as opposed to merge sort where we can't do it in place, right? Merge sort requires extra space. Quick sort does not. Um, and um, what we do is that we just select the first, what we're going to do is that like, actually the dependent, how well merge sort will run depends on how well we select the pivot value as we'll see, because we're selecting the random value out of here. Um, and we'll see that basically on the best case scenario, quick sort is, is n log n. In average case, it's n log n. Worst case scenario, quick sort is terrible. It takes O of n squared algorithm in the worst case. If we uh, if we have a very naive method of sorting it. So trace of quick sort works like this. Well, for simplicity's sake, we'll start by selecting the first item as our pivot. And what we'll do is that we'll essentially put the pivot in the middle. I mean, this is actually blatant lies. This is how it works. But it's the way it works when you're initially explaining quick sort. So this is the way it works for the next five minutes. Okay, grab a pivot, put in the middle, put all the items that are less than uh, the pivot to the left, all the items that are greater than the pivot to the right. And then repeat until it's all sorted. So you've got, so on the left, you've got 12, 33, 23, 43. It's not sorted, but it's more sorted than it was, right? And all the items that are bigger are on the right. Now you just do quick sort on, on each of those remaining subarrays. And you choose the first value of this of each subarray to be to be the to be the pivot. Okay, and it it works. It, it's it makes sense that it works, right? Um so let me just go ahead and like show that on the board as far as like the before we start getting into how it really works. Again, this is the way it works for the next five minutes, okay? Because it's going to be a bit of a mess, and then we're going to start just going into how do we actually do this in place. Because right now, the way I'm presenting it is how you do it if you want to waste, waste a lot of space. <coughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so again. Select our first value arbitrarily as the pivot over here. So I'll just write it down over here. Four is our pivot, okay? So now we want to go through the array and, sit and put all the stuff that's bigger than it to the right and all the stuff that's smaller than it to the left. So five is bigger, two is smaller, six is bigger than four, one is smaller than four, seven is smaller, three, and eight. And look at that. That kind of actually automatically sorted right there. Um, so now we got to uh, choose the. So now over here on the. So now we just do quick sort on each of the halves, right? So we select the first item as our pivot again, and uh, put anything that's less than two, two over here, and then greater than two over here. So one and three, right? They're already sorted because they're size one, right? 
So now over here, we choose the first pivot as our as our item, and then we put everything that's bigger there. Sorry, the first thing over here as our pivot. Everything that's pivot that's greater than our pivot, we put to the right. Everything that's less, we put to the left. Well, everything's greater, so we put to the six, seven, eight. Choose the first item as our pivot. Put everything to the right. Right. So we've got. So now, if you read right to left, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Right. So it's sorted, at least if you just look at the circle items. Okay. And I mean that's kind of the way quick sort will work if you're doing what if you're like sorting a bunch of piles of paper. So. But we want to do this in place. And also notice what happened over here. Uh, five was the pivot, then six was the pivot, then seven was the pivot, then eight was the pivot, because all these things were in order, right? Didn't really have a way to deal with that. Um, so what the pivot value is actually has a great, uh, has a huge influence on the way this runs. Um, so everybody understand kind of the, the general idea. You have a you you have a pivot, basically, and you put everything to the left, every uh, that's smaller, everything to the right, that's bigger, and then you recursively uh, uh, apply quicksort on those subarrays. So we'll describe how to basically partition everything later, which is uh, the whole putting everything to the left and everything to the right. But on the algorithm for quicksort, right for right now, as we apply, is is like this. Uh, indices first and last are the endpoints of uh, that's th th those are the indices of the array that you're sorting, and the pivot and the index of what you're pivoting is this. So if first is less than last, right? In other words, it's so long as we've got stuff to pivot. Um, partition the elements so that basically the pivot in the mid is in the correct place. So all the stuff that's less than the pivot, it, so pivot goes to the middle. All the stuff that's less goes to the left. All the stuff that's greater goes to the right. Recursively, uh, a quick sort all the stuff before pivot, all the stuff after pivot. Okay. So if so, um, let's just go ahead and so here's the analysis of it. If pivot is a random value se selected from the uh, array, then essentially that you know if it's a big enough array, then half the stuff is going to be smaller, half the stuff is going to be bigger, right? Sometimes it'll be maybe like forty percent and sixty percent, or sixty and forty, right? But um, it's about so essentially, it'll be you know we treat we it'll look a lot like merge sort, right? We um you know you have this array and then you split it essentially into two equal halves, okay? That also get quick sorted, right? And those halves get uh, quick sorted, right? And you can only split log n times. And since doing this whole thing takes, oh, since the whole partitioning operation, splitting it in half takes O of n time, right? Because you're just going through all the items and saying, you need to go to the left, you need to go to the right, right? However many layers, it'll, if it takes log n layers and each layer takes O of n time, it's going to be n log n again in the, if it works optimally, just like, just like merge sort. However, um, that's if it splits you know, in the way we want it to, which is 50-50 each time. It's not going to split 50-50 each time because we're selecting random values and the universe hates us because we're computer scientists, okay? Um, so it's it's a bit hard to analyze it, so we're not going to try to, but, but let's say that basically we're given a reverse array and we keep choosing the first item, right? So say we are given, we're given the array, the, the following array to click sort. Um, and our pivot we're selecting as the first item in the array. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. So let's select the first item in the, pivot, in the array as the pivot and go through all the items. Put everything that's bigger on, uh, sorry, everything that's smaller to the left, which would be eight, seven, uh, six, five, four, three, to one, and then we select everything big uh, seven as our pivot, and then put everything to the left. And then we select six as our pivot, and put everything to the left. And then five as our pivot, and everything to the left. Right? We'd only sort one item at any given time, which is kind of, and we don't have a right half anymore. We only have a left half. So that algorithm kind of just doesn't work, right? Actually, it will eventually work. It just will take 
well, we went through eight items, then seven, then six, then five, then four, then three, then two, then one, right? That's, that's an N, O of N squared behavior. So we'll need to learn how to choose our pivots better, but for right now, uh, just know that worst case scenario, o, it's O of N squared. In the worst case, really, no matter what our strategy is. Um, but we can just make, we can reduce our chances significantly of getting into that worst case. So the question is now, how do we do that whole partitioning thing? Um, if the array is put into a random order, then what we'll do is that we will uh, simply select the first element to be our pivot. Okay, that's just what we're going to do. We're always going to select the first element as our pivot for simplicity's sake. And this is going to color them. If it's less than the pivot, it's going to be blue. And if it's greater, it's going to be light purple. So there you go. It's colored. It's kind of settled on the board. Okay. So what we're going to do is that we have are going to have two val. We have essentially four variables going around here. We have first, we have five variables. We have our pivot. So sorry, we have the index of our pivot. We have our the first thing in, in the subarray we're sorting, the last thing in the sub, uh, subarray we're sorting, and then we have what we call up and down. So what we do, and it works pretty simply. Uh, up starts from the bottom of the array and goes up. Down starts from the top of the array and goes down. Makes sense, right? Up and down. Goes from, up starts at the bottom and goes up. Down starts at the top and goes down. Up goes until it hits the first thing that's bigger than our pivot. So not too, so 75 is, is the first thing bit, uh, going as we go up that's bigger than our pivot. Down starts at the end of the array and goes down until it hits the first thing smaller than our pivot. Okay. That didn't take long at all. It was, the, it was the last thing in the arrays, right? Up started at the beginning, down started at the end. Makes sense? They found the first thing that, up found the first thing's bigger, down found the first thing that's smaller. And now what we, all we do is we swap them. Okay? And then we repeat. So start, start, so we can start from where we left off. Uh, uh, 23 is smaller, 43 is smaller, 55 is bigger. So that's our new up. So up stops there, then down looks for the first value that's smaller. Uh, 75 is not smaller, 77 is not smaller, so up always finds the bigger, down always finds the smaller. Uh, so finally we hit 12, which is the smaller one, right? That's So we started from here, it's not smaller, not smaller, that's smaller. So we found an up, we found a down. Now we swap them. Oh, and look at that, after two exchanges, um, we've got it, we've got the array sorted into three portions or partitioned into three portions. We have all the stuff that's, we have the pivot, then all the stuff that's bigger than the pivot, sorry, all the stuff that's smaller than the pivot and all the stuff that's bigger than the pivot, right? Although ideally, what, what do we want? We want a smaller pivot bigger, right? Right now we have pivot smaller, bigger. We want smaller pivot bigger. That's not hard to solve. Um, but the computer hasn't detected that. The computer detects that. When, because we're still going to keep going. Up finds the first thing smaller, a down finds the first, sorry, up finds the first thing bigger, down finds the first thing smaller. And this is how the, the computer knows when it's done. When up and down cross each other, when, when down is, is lower than up, it knows it's finished. At that point, we're done. It's detected that we're done and that we, uh, then we swap stuff. So how do we make us, how do we make this um, into something, into all the stuff that's smaller, the pivot and all the stuff that's bigger, but well, we swap the pivot with the with the thing at down. And look at that, it's partitioned. So I guarantee that I, I can guarantee you, because it's been on the final for the past couple semesters, that this is going to be a question on the final exam. Literally doing this uh, this uh, this pivot operation, this is uh, uh, this partitioning operation, okay, and doing a single Think of it. So here's the algorithm. The first item becomes the pivot. First, initialize uh, up is uh, up is the first location. Down is the last item. Do up until it hits the uh, first item that's bigger than the pivot, or until you got to the end of the array. Decrement down until down hits the pi uh, the first item smaller, or until until it hits the uh, first item in our subarray. If up and down haven't crossed yet, swap up and down. And keep doing this while basically while up is and down haven't crossed. 
once we're done with this, take your the item in the take the pivot value and swap it with the down with with the current with the item currently at down. And then you can return the the index that other pivot. So let's see how that works in practice on a, on one of our own um, examples. Okay. <coughs> Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six, five, seven, eight. Okay, so, so we've got this, we've got all these values. So this is the first value of the subarray, this is the last value of the subarray. Up starts here, down starts here, and by the way, this is also our pivot. Just to keep that, just just to keep that, um, you know, in your mind. Okay. So, um, so we have our pivot value. So now what we need to do is that we need to go starting from, we go up and we we start the, at first and we look for the first thing that's bigger than our pivot. So up, find the first thing that's bigger than our pivot. Right? That's uh that's seven. Now down needs to find the first thing. We start this end and we find the first thing that's smaller than our pivot. So eight is not smaller than our pivot. Three, on the other hand, is smaller than our pivot. So we've got up and down over here. Right? Up starts from the bottom, goes to the top, and it stops whenever it hits something, finds something small. And I'm oh, sorry, bigger. Down starts at the bottom and, and stops when it finds something smaller. So up search for greater, down searches for smaller. Okay, found them, now we swap them. Three and seven. Now, we use up to find the first thing that's bigger. So this is not bigger than the pivot, this is not bigger than the pivot, this is not bigger than the pivot. This on the other hand is bigger than the pivot. Down, we'll look for the first thing that's smaller than the pivot. So up and down, we found the first thing. We found the first thing bigger, the first thing smaller. They've crossed at this point. That means that if you notice, we've successfully partitioned it into all the things smaller and all the things bigger, and the pivot, right? And them and up and down crossing is how your computer is how the algorithm knows that. So now at this point, what we do is to partition it correctly. We swap what's at down with our with our pivot. And then we return this index over here because that's the location of where our pivot is. And so we've split this up into now three into three subarrays. We have our pivot over here, we have, and then we have this stuff, and then we have this stuff. All right, so we're not done yet. By happy coincidence, this has already sorted itself. Happy coincidence. But this one hasn't. So let's go and do our left side first. Okay, so we select the first item as our pivot. Okay, so we've got our first value, the last value, right, of the subarray that we're sorting is here. So up, pivot, down. So now look for the first thing. Uh, now up looks for the first thing bigger than our pivot. Sorry, up looks for the first thing. Uh, yep, bigger than our pivot. Uh, down. So down looks for the first thing smaller than our pivot. Okay, so um, up and down have crossed, right? That means that basically that we've successfully partitioned it, the array, this into two portions. Everything that's smaller than the pivot, which is nothing, everything that the pivot, and everything that's bigger than the pivot. So now we say swap pivot with down. So we swap it with itself, right? This is, this is what we call a poor pivot, right? Because we didn't really partition anything. Now we click search the left, which is nothing, so no work to do there, and then we quick sort the right. So now we have to sort this subarray. First, last. Now on the exam, you simply do the single a single pass. In other words, you just simply do the topmost layer, right? You don't have to do the recursion. You just have to do one the top operation. So I'm just showing how it works in practice. Up, down, find the first thing that's bigger. Then the pivot. First, find the first thing that's smaller than a pivot. 
So up and down across, so we swap the pivot and with down. And then quick sort the left, quick sort the right. Uh, the left is one is one item, so that's our base case, so we don't bother doing anything, and the right side is one item. So we just return it because we're done. So we've done the left side, and on the right side, we go, okay, I'm gonna quick sort this, I'm gonna select this as a pivot, find, you know, up, down doesn't find anything, so <coughs> swap down with itself, and we do that repeat again and again over there. Okay? So as you can see, it's sorted. This is the way quick sort works. Now, we, the issue is that we had, um, um, so the only issue is that basically it was kind of, it was kind of rough because, a lot of time, because we ended up with this thing already sorted, and then one was the smallest pivot, was the smallest item, but we used it as our pivot, which was kind of a bad choice. So how can we get around that, right? I mean, the only way we can truly know what pivot to use is if we iterate through basically the entire array, and find uh, and figure out what value is the median value, right? Because you want to use the median value as your pivot, the middle value, because half the items are going to be smaller and half the items are going to be bigger. But to find your median value, you're going to have to go through all the items of the array, which would take O of n time, which is kind of, and we'd like to be a bit quicker than that. So instead, what we do is that we guess, we, we make a bit of a better choice. Instead, what we're going to do is that we can, um, if we want to use it, we can improve quicksort a bit um, by uh, proving a better pivot value. Instead, we're going to look at the first item of the array, the last item of the array, and the middle item of the array. It takes almost no time to get those because, right, you know what the length of the array is, you know what the first item of the subarray is, and then, right, you find first and last on the right, you'll read them, and then middle, well, that's just you know, the index of the first plus the index of the last divided by two, right? So we get the middle pretty instantly. Compare those three, uh, sort those th uh, three, and use the middle value as the pivot. That's more likely, at the very least, you're going to end up with one value in the, le in the left side. So let's see how that works over here. So you've got first, middle, and last. So we sort these three. 33, 44, and 55. Okay. And then we're going to use the middle value as our pivot. So that means, kind of unintuitively, that means it becomes the first item. And we use that as our pivot. Now we run that partition, alg uh, partition algorithm again using that pivot, and we do it every single time, uh, that kind of thing every single time. So let's see how that works. Now on the exam, you don't have to use this version of it. You can use the basic version of it. But it's good to know this is how we make it better. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so different array here. And then I think that I'll need, so for the middle value, I'll just simply call it the, um, right, for the middle value here, say it's the, it'll be, the, you know, we'll be here to the left. So let's figure out, so we've got 6, 8, and 7, right, first, middle, last, right, so we sort these guys, so sorting three items is pretty easy, we have 6, 7, 8, and then we use the middle, and then we're going to use the middle, oh, the middle item of this as our pivot. It's not always great, but 7, 6, Eight. And now we uh, run quick sort like normal. So we find the first thing that's bigger, find the first thing that's smaller than our pivot, up and down across. So we're done. So we swap the pivot with down. And let's see, this was five. Okay. So Right side is one, left side is here. I think I've accidentally made another terrible array, but that's what happens when you're dealing with small arrays. So now we, we just need to quick sort this bunch. So we have um, a first, last, 
The middle value over here is 3. Sort these three. And we've got, uh, we had 3, 4, 5. Use the middle as our pivot. 4 and 3. So now, um, we run it as normal. So first, last, up. This is our pivot again. Okay, so search up for the first thing bigger. Search um, down for the, use down to search for the first thing smaller. Up and down have a cross, so we swap those things. Search for the first thing bigger. Search for the first thing smaller. Mm -hmm. And uh, swap pivot over here. And then at that point, if you're getting to three or two items, you can all, since you're already sorting them, you might as well sort them. And so we sort the left half, sort the right half. We're done. So quick sort. So so using the pivot helps. It means we always have something to the left. It always means we have something to the right, even if the split isn't always the best. So that's the way quick sort works. Um, all right. How much time do I have left? Uh, Twenty five minutes. It looks like. Okay. <clears throat> so now we're going to learn uh, the last of the n log n sorting algorithms, which is heap sort. So heap sort, well, you've got a lot of slides there. Okay. Heap sort, unsurprisingly, this is the key. Okay. Um, the big difference is that we're going to be using a max heap rather than a min heap, right? Min heap, which is what we use on the exam, that meant that the smallest item was in the root. Max heap means the biggest item. Okay, um, merge sort, it needs n extra storage locations. Heap sort does not require any extra location uh, because it assumes you're using an array and heap sort uses a heap to store the array. So if you're using something like an array list, this is ideal. If you're using the linked list, merge sort's better. So this is the basic version of your heap, of a heap sort that you might imagine. So, um, if you're using a priority queue, then you put, right, if we're dealing with the min heap, right, before we go and start thinking about max heaps, imagine we, we are using a min heap, right? What we can do is that we can turn our array into a heap, okay? Not, what, the way we know how to do that right now takes uh, O of n time to do that. Sorry, n, n log n time. You have n items, you're going to add them each to a, to a heap. That takes n log n time. So that's adding an item takes log n. And then remove each heap item. And basically place it into back into the array. It so you basically copy everything you item into a heap, copy and then DQ from the from the priority queue, right? And then each time you DQ, it will give you the next biggest item, right? So insert every item into the array to be sorted into by, into the heap. And then while the priority queue is not empty, get the first item and and slap it onto the back of the array, right? That will give you the smallest item, then the next smallest item, the next smallest item, and that takes just, and that takes n log n time, n log n to add all the items, n log n to, uh, to, to remove all the items, and it takes O of n extra space. Okay, um, so yeah, so how can we fix that? Well, uh, the heaps we've used so far, each parent value um, was uh, smaller. Right? Each parent was smaller than his children. So we're going to build a heap where the value is not smaller than children. It's, in fact, bigger than his children. So here is the idea of, of heap sort. What we're going to do is that we are going to take an array and turn it into a heap, a max heap. That means that the root is bigger. Okay? So 89 is bigger than 76 and 74. 74 is bigger than 39 and 66. So in here, the bigger items are lighter. Okay. So then what we do is that we take the root and we remove it. We do the removal operation, but with a slight twist. Here, normally in a removal operation, we would just simply delete. Um, you know, we'd take six and over, we'd, we'd take six and overwrite 89 with it. Here, what we're going to do is that we're going to swap them. 
and then pretend 89's been deleted from the array, right? So we pretend that this thing has been gr this green that anything that's green is been kind of uh, been you know it no longer exists in the uh, heap. So then we reheapify. So six. So we need to swap it with the bigger of its children because this is a max heap. So swap it with the bigger bigger of its children. Uh, 37, swap it with 26, and then continue. 76 gets swapped with 29. Why not 89? Because we're pretending 89 no longer exists. <coughs> so we swap it with what we what's the last value in the array. And then 29's at the top, so we swap it with 74 because 74 is the bigger of its children. Swap 29 with 66 because it's the bigger of its children. Then we continue for 74, move that to the back of the end, swap it with 28. 28 swaps with 37. Sorry, 28 swaps with 66, then with 39. And then it just continues going on. But notice what's happening to each of the uh, you know green items, the ones that are removed from the array. It's kind of sorting it in the reverse order. It's sorting them, just kind of in the reverse order we expected to, right? But it moves the biggest item to the back because the biggest item was in the root. Then it moves the next biggest item. Then it moves the next biggest item to the back. Then it moves the next biggest item to the back. Then the next biggest item to the back. It's slowing, sorting it one at a time. And, and as long as we're pretending that that item is deleted from the from the heap, then we've got a heap. Then we've got basically uh, this going on in O of n time. Sorry, in uh, sorry, in, in constant space, uh, with each of these take O of n time to remove, uh, n log n time to remove, and there's O of n. Uh, so if we remove a heap as an array, so so right here's an, the array view of the of what we just did, right? This was the array view of what of the array of what we just had. 89, and then its children were 76 and 74. So 76 its children were 37 and 32, right? So we turned our array into a heap, which is a problem of itse in itself, but we'll get to that another day. 89 gets swapped with, um, so here 89 gets moved to the back and we swap it with 6 and then we push 6 down into the appropriate place to reheapify. Then we take 76 and move it into the back, swap it with, tw put 28 up here and then reheapify it. And so on and so forth. We take 74 and move it to the back. Then we take 66 and move it into the back. Then we take uh, 39 and move it to the back. So on and so forth until the entire array is sorted. So the algorithm is pretty simple. Um, build a heap by rearranging the items into an unsorted array, and while your heap is not empty, remove the first item from the heap, but, in, but remove it by, instead of deleting it, moving it to the back of the heap, and restoring the heap property. So how do you build a heap? Um, so well, it basically goes into an n log n version. So basically, uh, you just simply insert each item of the array into the heap. And that will take take n log n times. Now, there's a more efficient way to do that, but I don't want to get into that right now. I'll get into that at the end of the semester. Um, instead, I want to use our remaining time to go over an al a sort of our final sorting algorithm. Okay? One that is not going to be on the test, one that is not in the book, but it's valuable to do and to know. Okay? All of these are... so. Let's just look at a summary of all these things, of all these things. So there's a nice big table at the end here for sorting algorithms. Now we we uh, compare our sorting algorithms by the number of times we have to compare one item to another. Okay, that's how we rate these, right? Selection sort does n squared. Bubble sort has O of n squared. So you've got your n squared sorting algorithms. But merge sort is n log n. Heap sort is n log n. Quick sort is n log n on average, but if you've got bad pivots, it can be O n squared. But these are all these algorithms work by comparing one item to another. Okay. But you don't have to build sorting algorithms that way. We built sorting all these sorting algorithms work the same way. You compare two items to each other. So now we're going to learn about radix sort, R A D I X, and it works in the most peculiar of fashions. Not by using any uh, compare, it doesn't compare to anything. It does it does no single comparison on anything. Instead, what it uses are cues. It just uses cues to sort things, um, and it also has a very odd uh, 
It also has a very odd runtime. Um, runtime is O of N W, where W is the max word size. That's kind of a run, uh, odd runtime. We'll get into that in a second. But essentially, it's each pass, there's W passes, each pass takes O of N time, where N is the number of units. Okay. Um, and typically, N and W are going to be very, very different things. So, I'm gonna, unlike all the other things, I'm going to be using uh, I'm going to be using three-digit numbers to, to, to sort something with erratics. Or, and it's very easy. Um, in fact, this is basically how, if you wanted to build a machine that did sorting, a physical machine that did sorting, versus a computer that did sorting, this is the way to do it, and it's been done that way. This is how you sorted before you had computers. So, uh, seven, eight. Five two one nine uh three hundred and seventy two uh ninety-eight um one forty six and that should be enough. So we've got these items over here. So those are the items we want to sort. So the way radic sort works is that we are going to create a queue for every single possible digit. Okay, so, um, and by digit, I mean the value that each digit could have, right? We're working in a decimal system, so we're going to have uh, 10 cues, one for zero, one for one, one for two, and so on and so forth, right? If we had, if we were sorting characters, we'd have, so if we were sorting words that were all lowercase, then we'd have 26 different cues, okay? If we were sorting binary numbers, we'd have two cues, one for zero, one for one. Zero, one. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So one Q for each possible value. Okay. So the way this works is that we look at the least significant, we start out by looking at the least significant digit of each of these numbers. Okay. And then throwing it into the appropriate Q. So 785 goes into the 5 Q. 219 goes into the 9 cube, then to the 9. And you might be going, wait, you're doing comparison. I'm like, no, I don't. No, I'm not. If this is an array of cues, then all I'm doing is modulo. I don't even have to do comparison. Just mod by 10 and throw it into the index that I, that I just found figured out. 372 goes over here. 98 goes into here. And then 146 goes into the 6Q, and then let's go and do um, uh, 136 as well, and throw that into here. And then we just go through each of these Qs from the first one to the last one, and DQ, and DQ everything until it's empty. So 372, and then 785, and then 146 and 136. And then 98 and then 219. Now you might be go now you might say that really hasn't done much, but what we have done is that we've sorted everything by the least significant digit, right? Everything that ends with two has come first, then five, everything that ends with five, then all the things that end with six, then eight, then nine. Okay? Now what? Now we move on to the next most significant digit. So we go on, so we go with the tens place. So we put 372 into the 7 Q because its middle value is 7. Then we put 785 over here. Then we put 146 into the 4 Q because its middle value is 4. 136 goes into the 3 Q because its middle value is 3. 98 goes into the 9 Q. And 219 goes into the 1 Q. And then we just simply read everything out. 219, 136, um, 46, 372, um, 785, and then 98. So if you notice that if all these were two-digit numbers, by the way, if all these were two-digit numbers, it would already be sorted. 
but these are three-digit numbers. So now we go for the most for the most significant digit. Okay, uh, 219 gets thrown into here. Uh, 136 gets thrown into here. Uh, 146 goes in, in after 136 because remember it's a Q. Um, 372 goes here. 785, um, and 98. And then DQ. Wait, so 98, wait, that doesn't go there. Where should it go? It's going to the zero Q, right? Because its leading digit is zero, because it doesn't exist. So now we DQ. 98, 136, 146, 219. 372, 785, and would you look at that? They're all in order. That's kind of cool. We didn't have to compare any single, we didn't have to do any comparisons between one, other, from one another. That's pretty cool. Um, and it took three passes for all these items, right? So we had n items and it took three passes because they were all three digit numbers. So how long would this take though in reality? It's not too bad on a computer. Well, um, right, so you've got n items, okay? So what is w going to be? Well, uh, if we're sorting integers, uh, integers are 32 bits, meaning they're 32 binary digits. So we'd have a 0q and a 1q, so we'd only have two q's. But how many times would we have to run through it? Well, they're 32 binary digits long, so we'd have to run through it basically 32 times. So it would be 32n, essentially, for, for uh, binary integers, which sounds like that's constant time, because sorry, linear time, because, right, 32 is just a, is just a uh, constant at that point. But that's a bit of a lie, because when we look at n log n, right, um, if lot, right, this is what we get with, like, merge sort, or heap sort. If this is going to be 32, what value does this have to be? This would need to be 2 to the 32. So we'd have to be sorting about uh, 2 billion items for, for radix sort to be more worth it, essentially. And most of the time, we're sorting less than that. Um, and you know, merge sort actually paralyzes pretty well. As what, uh, you know, that's another thing you can. You can sort it, you can do map reduce using merge sort. You can basically, uh, you know, you can split the, if you've got billions of numbers, you can split them up into millions of numbers and give them each to different computers, right, and have them do merge sort on their million. And then you can then come merge your millions together, right? So it parallel, so merge sort paralyzes really well. Um, but it's really cool. To see how that works. Um, but the reason I bring it up is because I get to show you some really cool pictures. Radix sort. Okay. Um, so worst case complexity is WN, right? Here is an IBM card sorter which does Radix sort, and it did it on sets of punch cards. Right, so this isn't a computer. This is just a sort a machine, a physical machine that was that did sorting. It, you know, took a bunch of punch cards and would put them into a bunch of piles. I mean, how many piles do we have here? We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Don't know why we have thirteen piles, but um, let's see what those piles say. Oh, they're for names or Thing. So that's what they simply say. So pile one is A through J, O is S through Z, two is so. Let, sorry, that's not really sure what they have here. I don't know how to read this, but I'm sure that when they made it, they knew how to do it. So one of the thirteen output baskets, the crank near the input hardware is used to move the read head. So hey, it's got a crank. It says it's a computer ancillary equipment. But, um, you know, it's a physical machine that does this, not a um, 
doesn't necessarily do it with, uh, with software. So this is a really cool alternative, uh, especially if, again, right, compare if we're comparing things and comparing things are expensive, then this is a great alternative to use. Um, you know, so it, it's a really cool kind of uh, kind of way to do it. Um, there's a whole bunch of different sorting algorithms here. You have um, shaker sort, the cocktail shaker sort, even odd sort, right? For these exchange sorts. For merge sort, you have different types of merge sorts. One that's like I never heard of that one, polyphase merge sort. It's, um, uneven distribution of lists. Um, it, there, there's all sorts of things. The big one that these use these days is Tim sort, which uh, is just an improved version of uh, um, uh, it's com it uses insertion sort and merge sort together, and that's you'll see that actually quite often. Like the the most basic level, what happens with insertion sort because insertion sort is so quick on on small subsets that basically if you're trying to sort an array or subarray that's only 64 that's 64 or less items. Instead of trying to do it like using quick sort, it will say, oh, I'll just insertion sort this bit because that's going to be quicker rather than trying to do a bunch of uh, recursive operations here, which might be more expensive. So insertion sort works really well that way. All right. So that's it for this chapter. I'm not sure what homework we'll do, we'll do with this one. We'll see. I'll see this. Uh, we'll see this Wednesday what I come up with. I don't because typically what I've done is like you know, implement these sorting algorithms, which isn't that hard because they're all in the textbook, right? Um, um, but we'll see. Um, but what we're going to move on for the rest of the semester, which isn't too long, is we're just going to skip chapter 9 and we're going to go on to chapter 10, which is graphs. And I just want to know for reference how many of you do know, have learned graphs and like math concepts at some point, right? And how many, well, I guess more important, how many of you have not learned about graphs yet? So like a couple of people, okay. And we're not talking like graphs, like like you like in algebra, right? We're talking uh, like uh, you know graphs for solving the bridge of Konigsberg kind of graphs. All right. So um, okay, that's it for today. Um, and this next unit is going to be really fun.